Jonathan has been in ELT for over 25 years. He collaborates with educational institutions and ministries of education, and he's been a teacher trainer, a teacher, and a materials writer. Matthew Hayes has been described to me as the Robert Kennedy of ELT, which is in fact one of the topics of his research. He's a doctoral researcher at the Institute of Education in London, and is uh, also researching global citizenship education. He's the director of Lean Library, and they both will be talking to us today about global citizenship education. What is it? How can we apply it? And why? So over to you guys, and thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Delighted to be here. Likewise, thank you so much. And I'm really enjoying seeing everyone's greetings in the chat box too. So thank you all for that. It's amazing to see where you're all coming from as well. It's, it's fantastic. Okay, so we're going to um, do a kind of a question and answer session together, uh, Matt, uh, discussion. And um, hopefully we'll get some questions uh, from the audience as well. Um, and we'll have time at the end to try and answer some of those questions. Um, right, I guess uh, the first question, if I, I lead off, Matt. Um, so, in simple terms, uh, what is global citizenship education? So, um, absolutely. So, we, we, Jonathan and I thought that a, a conversation might be most interesting today, so we can get questions from you as well. So, I hope you like the uh, informal tone of this. Um, so, global citizenship education is uh, a framework for um, education that has both historical and recent origins. So historically, the idea of a global citizen has been around for a long, long time. Um, you can trace it back to ancient Greek history um, with philosophers like Diogenes talking about citizens of the world, uh, but also um, philosophers in other cultures as well. Um, for example, in China and India, talking in similar terms, the idea of um, citizens outside of uh, a particular country and region in, globally. Um, but it can also be traced more recently to uh, post the Second World War, really, and the founding of the United Nations, um, which resulted in uh, global initiatives like the Human Rights Charter that started to pose these questions of what does it mean to be a citizen of the world? What are the rights and responsibilities uh, that that provides? Uh, and as a result of that, some educational ideas then sprang from that. Um, and so broadly speaking from in terms of an educational concept it's about preparing students for the challenges of a globalized world um, so all of the opportunities and challenges we face as global citizens as members of humanity not just as uh, citizens of individual nation states um, and that that might work as a good very broad overall introduction um, but jonathan should we talk a little bit now then of how we how we conceive it in terms of three different areas of global citizenship? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I guess we've got to go back to these two key terms, haven't we? Uh, global and then uh, the citizenship part as well. Um, so for me, in, in terms of what this kind of means, when we break it down, um, I mean, global to me is looking at uh, just kind of beyond the individual in many respects. Uh, when we're focusing, uh, for example, with pre-primary, often the, the students are just looking at the, the individual, but it's going beyond that and getting students to focus on uh, their family, their community, their town, um, the country, the world. So kind of global can be broken down, not just in terms, I think, of, of the world, but in terms of what's going on around me as an individual. Um, what about the, the C, Matt, the citizenship part? Uh, how do you see that? Yeah, absolutely. And it's interesting to see in the chat that that's the one thing I think that Jonathan and I can most help uh, define, because the citizenship aspect to global citizenship education is what really stands it out from similar related educational trends like global education, um, the 21st century skills ideas, critical thinking and areas like that. And so citizenship um, really is about rights and responsibilities. So as a citizen of the world, you have certain rights. Uh, but you also have responsibilities and it's this active idea of citizenship the idea that you have a responsibility to make the world a better place to tackle injustice in the world um, to address global issues uh, that may be at a local level like 
uh, issues with the environment, um, with poverty, with uh, immigration, with all, all manner of, uh, of global issues. Uh, you have a responsibility as a global citizen to be engaged in those issues and to help addressing them. And I think that's the, that's the really key differentiator. Um, so we've kind of collaborat collaborated recently um, to look at uh, you know, how you can sort of implement this uh, theory in practice uh, in a classroom. Um, I'm just going to bring up the slide here where you said, um, you know, kind of three areas that we were uh, looking at. Um, I'll find the slide here. Uh, so I think it's important when you're looking at global citizenship education that you have knowledge about uh, the world outside, uh, what's happening. Um, obviously, you come with your own attitudes to what's going on in the world, and perhaps you want to look at ways to change those attitudes. And you've already mentioned the importance of being active. So looking at the kind of actions that are involved in that. So that's kind of how we, we sort of, we've broken this down. Do you want to add a bit more to that? Yeah, absolutely. This has been a lot of fun for Jonathan and I um, collaborating and sharing ideas on this because uh, I have this research background. So I'm looking at global citizen education um, in the classroom. I'm specifically looking at it and in ELT textbooks in the United Arab Emirates. And uh, but so I have that sort of theoretical background and Jonathan's really helped me think about how this is deployed in the classroom. And so what we hope this helps do is frame global citizen education in three distinct areas, which will be probably very familiar to you because they are really just the three areas of the Bloom taxonomy. So you have knowledge is one area. The second area is attitudes and action. And the third is skills. And in putting this together, together, Jonathan and I see global citizen education as a kind of scaffolded approach. So you can begin by building awareness amongst students, building that knowledge. So, for example, uh, global citizen education can really begin at kindergarten and, and pre-primary and primary because it's all about um, just building that knowledge gradually. So it can begin by thinking about um, your local community and the issues in your local community, what that community actually means, the, the uh, very familiar concepts of building out from your family into your community, your school, and, and so on from there. Um, and then as you, as you grow up in age, you can start looking at uh, perhaps more sophisticated things, like uh, things like um, the, the Charter on Human Rights, but also things like the environment, sustainability. I, I see some colleagues have also mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you could also start talking about those. I think that's really about building that knowledge base. And then um, the skills piece is then then comes in. And that that is where you start to build students' awareness of how they can collaborate amongst each other, their creativity, their, their communicative skills, and also their questioning skills, so the critical thinking, but really going beyond uh, critical thinking to actively question the world around them. Um, and then in building that, that then leads to a change in attitudes and into the action. So the aim would be that at the end of that um, education period for students, they're then able to implement their knowledge with the skills they have to affect change in the world and to, to, to bring forward that action. So um, in terms of knowledge, then, it, it's, not, it's useful to know about things and issues that are happening in your community and in your country and in your world. But I guess what we're saying is it's not sufficient just to, to know about these things. Uh, you also have to consider what your own attitude is towards these issues and perhaps look at attitudes of other people and how that might influence you either reinforcing your current attitude or changing your current attitude and then through that leading into uh, examination of what actions people are doing and possibly then the kind of actions that you as an individual or you as part of a community might do. Um, I thought perhaps the skills area we're very familiar with um, skills work and these are kind of soft skills but um, when we were looking at the area of skills, we sort of adapted and developed what perhaps many people think of as collaborative, creative, questioning, or communicative skills. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we should have a, a quick mention of what we're referring to here. I mean, the collaborative is fairly similar, but there are perhaps a, a, a few changes that we have considered. Um, Matt, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's, I really like that. And I think we should also talk about um, why these skills are 
uh, in the way that at least you and I can see them a bit different to 21st century skills. Um, and we talked about how um, in, a, um, in a true global sense of education framework and a curriculum over several stages, the aim should be to use skills that you may be familiar with from other concepts like 21st century skills, but use them in global citizenship contexts. So that's that's the real uh, distinction we, in, in our view. And I think we'll talk about this in a bit, but it's important to um, to note that nobody owns global citizenship education and that uh, you should question and criticize our interpretation of it. Um, but yeah, I think the key difference is that you may recognize a lot of these skills like critical thinking, um, but in uh, in some of the work Jonathan and I have been doing, we believe that that should really be deployed in global citizenship context. So for example, it would be a critical thinking exercise that engages with uh, the environmental challenges in your area or the economic challenges in your area, as opposed to say, a critical thinking uh, challenge that is, is divorced from some of those global issues. Um, that's not to say that um, all global skills must be developed in that way. I think certainly you can develop those skills separately um, at times and then come back to them um, in global citizenship context. But we do think that's that's the important differentiator. Um, what do you think, John? Is that yeah, so kind of when we look at um, collaborative skills, I can see some questions in the chat box. People are saying, so how is this really different from 21st century skills? So as you said, it's got to be within a context of um, looking at perhaps global issues. Um, and we're looking here at uh, what teamwork and setting goals, reaching those kind of goals, but within the issue of, um, I guess, kind of, you know, global justice, making a difference in the world, making some kind of positive impact on your own community, your town, um, a collaborative project that would lead to those kind of goals. Uh, and when we talked about creative skills, um, it's not really just talking about making things or uh, the arts, singing, uh, performing. Um, we're also looking here at things like the creativity to solve problems, I guess, uh, come up with solutions to be innovative. So some kind of creative approach to what's going on in your community or the world outside. Uh, think critical thinking skills, that's kind of certainly under the, the questioning skills. Um, but we're also here then questioning ourselves, aren't we? Uh, what we believe, what the kind of actions that we're taking, um, evaluating the types of uh, stances that we have in the world, and then also obviously looking in a questioning way at what's happening around, what decisions are being taken in the community or by organizations. Um, and the communicative skills, obviously we need to be able to uh, listen to other people, hear what they're saying. We need to also engage and take part in dialogues and discussions. And that might also then be in a, in a written format as well. I was I mean, gonna mention a bit about Bloom's taxonomy here because I, I skipped that a bit, but um, when we were looking at this, we did think that there was a good overlap with uh, Bloom's taxonomy and the different skills and the different levels that you go through in your education process. Do you want to um, add a bit to that one, Matt? Yes, absolutely. And I must um, I must remember, because it's really interesting to see the questions coming in. I'm, uh, uh, Jonathan as well, I think we're both trying to keep track of them. And I'd love to come back to the questions about um, whether global citizenship education cannot be deployed in certain contexts and uh, and really kind of help uh, zoom in onto what, you know, what's different about it. So I, I definitely would like us to yeah. come back to that. Um, yeah, so we, we, we referenced Bloom's taxonomy a bit earlier, but it does bear going into more detail on. I think um, uh, this is uh, where I, I've been trying to focus in my research. Um, in the uh, sort of academic scholarship to global citizenship, um, there is a, um, a limitation there, I think, that many of you may have seen if you've read uh, um, papers and articles about it, that it can be quite abstract and it can focus uh, on these quite tricky themes that are very broad. Um, and so I think um, what's useful is to think about how we can apply that all that academic scholarship um, into a context that we understand and use regularly in the classroom. And Bloom's taxonomy does, uh, does appear to be a particularly useful one because it's the taxonomy that um, is really behind the scope and sequence in most textbooks. Um, and also in generally in, in a lot of the pedagogy that um, I'm sure you will all, all use. And it gives you a, a, a really useful way of dividing 
uh, up your approach to a very big, ambitious uh, term like global sensor education. So if you think that the Bloom's taxonomy is broadly three areas, cognitive uh, skills, i.e. knowledge, uh, psychomotor skills, i.e. skills themselves, and then effective skills, i.e. attitudes, and uh, arguably the actions that flow from those attitudes, um, you can actually map a lot of the concepts around global sensor education to this. Uh, for example, you can take a very big, broad theme like like the UN Sustainable Development Goals that uh, some of you have mentioned. I can bring and those can, up, actually. Brilliant. And yeah, you can say, up. OK, let's let's not just um, put the environment in the textbook and just leave it at that and just have a kind of general reference to the environment. Let's break that down into we need to, first of all, give our students knowledge about the environment. So we need to just give them the facts. So let's give them an ELT exercise where they need to explore those facts and understand what's going on in the environment, maybe do some research in their um, local area or just look at some big uh, facts about the country or about uh, the world. Um, and then then you can give them the skills to address those issues. So going back to the, um, to the context I mentioned of doing some research about the environment in their local area, the skills there could be, well, it could be, you could have all manner of them. You could have collaboration because you could do it as a team. You could have communication because you could ask them to present their research back to the classroom. Um, you could have some critical thinking in there as well because you could pose some difficult uh, questions and ask them to, uh, to really examine the issue and turn things on, on its head. Um, and then you could lead to action because you could encourage students to then come up with maybe a project that will tackle that particular environmental challenge they've identified, or maybe could feed into a school-wide exercise, like uh, we're going to raise money to um, help support uh, the development of a local park, or we're going to um, volunteer uh, on in rubbish collection, or, you know, or we're going to uh, take our um, findings back to our parents and ask them to do a review of their uh, lifestyles and, uh, and habits and a uh, look at things like what what uh, what food they're throwing away or whether they are recycling uh, things like that I'm sure will be familiar to all of you but we um, uh, Jonathan I felt that if you if you could divide it up into those areas you can build a, um, a, a framework around that is really um, uh, manageable to, to implement in the classroom um, what do you is that is that a, a good uh, yeah I mean sort of what it all leads to, I quite like it on the screen, you can see that um, the sustainable development goals, these are goals to transform our world. And in effect, that's what we're kind of looking at here with global citizenship education, isn't it? We're trying to make a positive change in the world and to ourselves to, um, you know, make us um, part of something bigger than our, our own um, family or immediate needs. Uh, and interestingly, within the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, global citizenship is mentioned uh, in goal number four. Mm -hmm. uh, and this might address perhaps some of these questions that are popping up in the box uh, as to, you know, is it appropriate in certain contexts what's going on? And perhaps I should give a little background here that when I, I first joined Matt, I was quite skeptical about what was going on with global citizenship education um, and whether it is appropriate in all contexts and kind of what is the agenda behind it. But as we can see from uh, the UN, which has been these SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, have been signed up by all members of the United Nations. They do believe that uh, global citizenship is an important part of goal four, which is quality education. And I think it also gets uh, referred to in goal 12, which is responsible consumption and production. So perhaps I should uh, pose the question here that maybe the box, some of the chat box is focusing on. Um, yeah. Whose agenda is this behind um, global citizenship education? Is anybody trying to impose something on teachers and students? I think that's the, the big question. And I think uh, um, it's a question that we should all keep asking ourselves. Um, and I hope, by the way, that in, um, in trying to not be too prescriptive here, uh, Jonathan and I are being helpful rather than confusing. Um, but yeah, this is the really big question. And I would say that, um, first of all, to look at these UN Sustainable Development Goals, as, as Jonathan has just uh, implied, and, and I think actively said, actually, um, these are signed up to by the United Nations, which of course is the global community. It's not every country, um, but it's a, it's a good number of countries. So uh, generally speaking, 
um, these issues here should not be that controversial. Uh, of course, they might be in, in many respects, but but generally speaking, they, they should not be. And similar to the other things that we were looking at earlier with the UN Charter on Human Rights and some of those other things, you know, a lot of those have been signed up to globally. Um, so, uh, but, but there's a big but here, uh, but it is fair to say that um, there is a danger that when you talk about global citizen education, um, you know, particularly if you're um, uh, doing so from a position in the West, it can look as though you're imposing a Western agenda onto the rest of the world, um, you know, concepts like democracy and so on and so forth. Um, that's actually not what global citizen education is meant to be about at all. Um, it really should be instead about, and I think um, some uh, some of you have, have expressed this really nicely, where you've referred to quite broad ideas about making a positive change in the world. Well, the whole point there is that it's down to the individual to determine what they think positive change in the world is. Um, there should be a um, sort of commonly agreed, uh, very broad platform, but in terms of the, the the sort of granular detail of that, that really is down to each individual um, and each community. And I think what we're trying to do with global citizen education is just give individuals the uh, skills and the knowledge to be able to do that, as well as encourage them uh, to express that in the, in a way that they that they want to, um, so uh, but that that being said, I think we do also have to to recognise that even with that um, that broadness, there may still be contexts where it is not um, possible to implement the fullest extent of global citizenship education, um, and it's not for Jonathan and I to say what those contexts are. I think that's for um, for you as teachers to to understand, um, and and I think when um, whenever um, individuals like Jonathan and I are setting out uh, classroom activities or ideas to implement this, we would really love to encourage you to question those and and see whether you think uh, they reflect the spirit of global central education, and if you think they're appropriate in your in your classroom. We try our best to to make them. You know, universally applicable, but we do recognise as a, uh, you know, that we don't know everything, and that there is there are some difficulties there. Um, so I think that was my kind of scepticism at the beginning that I'd misunderstood what global citizenship education was. I thought it was imposing some kind of new methodology or new content onto teachers and students. But now, having worked with you, Matt, I realise it's the wrong way around at looking of looking at this issue. It's really examining what um, we as individuals believe and then looking at what um, is going on around us, what other people believe, um, trying to learn about, I guess, the other, what's going on out there in the world, what attitudes people out there have towards certain issues like the environment or, um, you know, uh, ways of setting up organizations um, and really getting our students and myself as an individual, as a teacher, just to examine um, my own position. What are my own beliefs? Um, what can I learn from other people around me? So I, I think when people say, aren't you imposing something? That's, that's not true. What we're doing is actually opening up people, including our students, to just um, see what's going on outside, learn from others. And perhaps this goes back to the, uh, the, the roots of global citizenship education uh, that you mentioned earlier that it was people looking beyond their own immediate community just to see what what's out there uh, i don't think you necessarily have to take what's out there and you don't have to give what's within your own um community or your own ideas but it's really um you know listening to other people um questioning yourself questioning your own values and seeing what you can do as the un here says to transform your world and the 17 um, goals of the Sustainable Development Goals, I, I mean, I think they encapsulate uh, a lot of the kind of topics that we have in our classrooms. And I think there's no reason why um, we can't be looking at these uh, within the classroom. And, and a bit later, we'll look at what kind of classroom that is, um, whether it's uh, looking at the English language classroom or, or something else. Um, so can I, I can guess... I just add, yeah. add one thing to that, because I think um, I'd also want to say that... Um, to go back to when when the question was first posed, it is the right question to be asking, and everyone should be asking, is this an imposition, as the first question, to make sure that it's not, really. To, and then the second thing I would say is that you should look out for uh, it not just being an imposition in terms of 
what what comes up a lot with global citizenship education is the idea that you know it's all about um, democracy and imposing democracy on parts of the world. Uh, that's one way of thinking about it as an imposition from the West. But another way of thinking about it as an imposition, whether it's from the West or from outside, is the idea of um, not really um, uh, following through on the full ideals of global citizenship education in terms of that citizenship piece, and instead just focusing on the easy bits, which are the, the we call it the global worker idea. Mm -hmm. So just focusing on the knowledge and skills. So just focusing on this idea of let's try and create citizens that um, are comfortable with differences between each other and differences in the global community, uh, can speak multiple languages um, and have uh, good economic skills like creativity, <clears throat> sorry, entrepreneurship and so on, uh, so that we have a really good knowledge-based economy um, globally. That That is also another uh, sort uh problematic imposition because whilst that's those are perfectly valid um aspirations they don't reflect the full ideals of global citizenship education because we also want to encourage um the development of citizens that that question things and that don't just uh sort of take things and as read and that also don't just apply the skills and the knowledge they have uh, in economic terms but also in uh, in terms of um, helping the challenges of the world and the challenges of their local communities. So I just uh, thought that would be a nice uh, nice piece to add as well. And I think there's a lot in this within developing the individual. Um, although they're learning about issues like the environment and uh, different organizations, the United Nations, uh, a lot of global citizenship education is about supporting um, a, a child, a student's development, um, building up their, their soft skills, as we've already mentioned, but building up their understanding of the world outside. Uh, I like a comment in the chat box. Someone says, you know, we're not alone in this world. Uh, that's a key aim, I think, of global citizenship, that uh, we don't have all the answers. There are other people out there with different views. Perhaps we can learn from them or perhaps we can question them. Um, what other benefits do you see for the individual out of global citizenship education, Matt? Um, well, one, one example that, um, that uh, you and I looked at, which I think might be a nice to, to keep trying to come back to, like how you do this in the classroom as well. So, so this conversation doesn't become too uh, as it, it's so enjoyable at these levels, but so so we try and keep it into that. We could talk about um, the counter stereotype examples mm -hmm. we came up with. Um, so here we thought um, about activities in the classroom that were about trying to turn stereotypes on their head. And um, uh, in a way, this kind of addresses some of the really difficult questions that I love coming in about, you know, how do you address, I think someone said totalitarian regimes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, massive, massive question, but let's begin with like a small, a small way we can do that. With counter stereotyping, the idea is to, um, you know, uh, small examples might be uh, when students see a, a uh, an image, uh, or no, sorry, when students uh, hear mentioned a nurse and a doctor, they might um, automatically assume a woman and a man. And you want to try and uh, draw that out. Uh, I'm not saying that that is, the, that is going to ne necessarily be the case, but it might be. And um, you can create activities that draw that out. And then you can question students as to why do they think that was going to be the case. Um, you can also actively present uh, counter stereotypes as well. So you can um, actively showcase um, uh, surprising situations that maybe students wouldn't ordinarily uh, be familiar with. Um, and the idea of doing that is to get students and, and children at an early age to start questioning the world around them. And I think if you think about this as one of the key uh, ideals of this whole educational framework, to question the world around them, it gives you an answer to the totalitarian regime piece as well, because uh, it's not for Jonathan and Matt to prescribe um, you know, a 10 point plan <laughs> for education in, in those contexts that's so going to address that. It's, this is, these are massive geopolitical issues, but we can, amongst our students, encourage them to question the world around them and to yeah. give them to give them that that gift. And it's like it's the gift of being a teacher, I think, which is amazing. The, you know, you don't um, uh, 
education is not just about education it's about those individuals that you are educating uh so it's not the education that's going to change the world i think it's the paulo freire quote but it's the individuals that change the world and so what you are doing as teachers is helping your uh your students go on to to use the education you give them in, in whatever way they see fit and i think if you can uh get them to really question things i think that would be a wonderful achievement and that's that's the stuff that uh I think is really wonderful about this because then then they can they can decide how to interpret it themselves so perhaps at this point we should um look at you've been talking about teachers well which teachers who's going to try and implement this um mm -hmm. you've given some examples concrete examples of activities already but perhaps this leads to the the practical question which i certainly was interested in myself how are we actually going to integrate uh, global citizenship education uh within the curriculum a lot of what we talked about and perhaps most of the audience here are english language teachers so i guess the question that arises then is it the responsibility of english teachers efl esl teachers to um to deliver uh global citizenship education um and perhaps my own answer to that would be it's not necessarily the word responsibility that mm. i'd go for but it's an opportunity for us as english teachers um to use this but i guess equally it is possible um within any any subjects matt what, what would you add Absolutely. here Absolutely, yeah, and um, I think you're right about the responsibility piece. Um, it that would sound as that would sort of sound anathema to our general the general approach that that we're uh, mm. trying to advocate. Imposing, which is, uh, sorry, it's imposing again. It's isn't imposing, it? yeah, exactly. It feels like it's imposing. But um, the only thing that is worth mentioning around the theme of responsibility for teachers is um, that. Um, particularly with something like English language teaching, um, there are a small number of very large um, multinationals that produce a lot of the content that is being delivered in English language teaching in local contexts, in, you know, in, the, in the textbooks and in um, online materials and, um, and also in, in things like uh, the, the um, accreditation systems and the tests like, um, that I'm sure you're all very familiar with. And so I suppose if you don't think about how you can give your students uh, a critical engagement with uh, all of that content, there is a danger. Um, and I think this is why um, middle education is to be lauded for looking at this area. There is a danger that the content is um, too Western or it's, you know, too, it, it uh, inadvertently uh, puts forward certain um, concepts and ideals about the world that are not global and that are not reflected in your particular part of the world. Um, and so what global citizenship education does give you is the ability to, to encourage your students to question that. Um, there's a wonderful video about this uh, where it talks about how um, a young young student in Nigeria, you know, thought that a... Um, a happy day was always um, being out uh, in the sunshine eating uh, cucumber sandwiches or something. And it was a, a, an illustration of how, particularly in the, the 70s and 80s, um, all of the educational content was very much uh, rooted in, you know, in uh, in contexts in England or in the US, which of course are not, uh, not really relevant there. Um, so I think whilst it's not a responsibility, it is a useful way of making sure that your students engage critically with the content in English language teaching textbooks and so that you don't feel that uh, there is that sense of imposition. Um, I think it's certainly a very good fit with English language teaching in terms of if we're teaching language and grammar. You've got to have some kind of context. You've got to have some kind of content. Um, when I started teaching uh, 25 years ago, it was often quite humorous texts about maybe a lady who lived in an aeroplane type thing. But you don't have to have those kind of banal texts to be dealing uh, mm. with language. You can deal with uh, topics that are uh, perhaps a bit more challenging, more interesting, more relevant to the, to the world around us. Um, and in many ways, a lot of topics in English language teaching, like uh, the environment, climate change, those are all natural topics that come up. Um, and we want to practice skills in speaking for giving opinions, and we want to practice, you know, writing um, essays that look at uh, advantages and disadvantages. And those kind of naturally fit, I think, within global citizenship education. Um, 
in maybe, terms also, of maybe you should talk because you know this is um this is where you, i think your background would be interesting if you talk about clill for example and how like the, the, what uh what uh, is being aimed for here is not necessarily i mean the actual um the ideas and the ideals are new but the idea of using the english language uh, subject or or um english language medium with other subjects to de to deploy other um, curriculum items is not new and you're no. So, so CLIL, content and language integrated learning. So what we're focusing on here is, um, you know, delivering some content. And um, when we're delivering that content, the students are acquiring the language and practicing the language at the same time. So the content is often, you know, it's physics, it's chemistry, uh, it's some issue perhaps in the humanities. So there's no reason why it can't be a, a global issue. And I think actually it's really interesting for the teachers as well as, as, well as the students to deal with some of those topics. Um, and I was interested, uh, last year, people might be familiar, I'm just going to bring it up, uh, PISA, which is the Program for International Student Assessment. Um, that's an international exam that looks at uh, reading and uh, science and mathematics. But last year, they also examined this question, which is on the screen. Do all students have equal opportunities to learn global and intercultural skills at school? So even this worldwide examination, um, uh, looked at, uh, I think not every country, but some of the participating countries, they looked at this issue of how interconnected uh, students feel they are in, in the world and um, what kind of things they'd need to um, perhaps be better interconnected in the world. Perhaps I could look at some uh, practical examples too then um, from Macmillan of some publications that uh, are currently out there, just to show how one can incorporate um, some of these global citizenship concepts um, it's kind of tweaking a few things that we do so I've uh, I've gone to global stage uh, publication one of Macmillan's primary works uh, this is level one in their literacy book uh, and I think this is a nice example um, the topic is house and home where do people live often in um, standard ELT books you get some atypical examples of homes uh, perhaps it's a traditional house and um, we've got an example here um, homes in Mongolia in the past often books perhaps just looked at a traditional yurt and students come away with the idea that all Mongolians live in a in a yurt a traditional tent which we know isn't true um, but I think what's nice here is that Macmillan also has a picture of a modern um, sort of rounded shaped building in uh, in Mongolia itself so you're you're getting away from the stereotype that you mentioned earlier, Matt, that when you're looking at homes, mm -hmm. yes, there are traditional homes, which are quite interesting and different, but it's not necessarily representative of the entire culture. So I think in the English language classroom, it's going a, a sort of step further to what perhaps is, is normally covered, which can often be a bit stereotypical. Um, and in their literacy book, you know, they've got a nice little text here. Again, level one, it's quite simple English about volunteering. Um, and that's an issue perhaps that uh, could be easily covered at, at level one. A couple more examples I've got. Um, this is one here that uh, looks at saving water and it uh, asks students, um, you know, how much water do you use? Uh, what kind of techniques can we have for saving water? So it's a good environmental theme. And in particular, it focuses on the question, um, how do people in your community uh, save water? Uh, and I guess it's going back to this action part of global citizenship education. It's not enough to know about the importance of water and the importance of saving water, but you've also got to consider what you can do or what your community can do um, to, to make a difference, in this case, uh, with uh, saving of water. So um, I, I guess what's happening here is that the type of text that we normally come across in English language teaching books, the type of exercises we do, uh, we're just kind of looking at them in, in a bit of greater depth. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of potential here for us to uh, make a really interesting lesson by exploring um, examples of what's happening in the world around, but then also focusing back on the individual students or our individual school and seeing what we could do to to learn from these situations or to make improvements within our own community. A couple more examples I've got here. Uh, this is looking at the issue of uh, recycling. The question we have is what can you do to reduce your impact on the environment? 
Um, I know, Matt, you had a, a nice idea about the carbon footprint. Um, do you want to expand a bit on, on that activity idea? Yeah, so I guess so the, the idea that you, you mean the, the one where you, um, as an individual, have to understand your own carbon footprint. And yeah. So maybe this is a good example. And I'm just so interested in, in the comments that are coming in as well. I really want to get to some of the tricky ones too. Um, but the, um, uh, the carbon footprint idea maybe is a little bit of an answer to that. It's a good example where uh, it should be applicable in all contexts. So, and it's also a good example of where you can scaffold these things out. So you could begin by asking students to go away and research their own carbon footprint. In doing so, you're obviously uh, building English language skills, uh, particularly if you do so within a structured textbook uh, setting where the authors know what particular English language skills need to be developed at that moment in the curriculum. Um, and you're, you're, of course, uh, developing those research skills, critical thinking and so on. So you could go away and do that. Um, you could then have something collaborative in the classroom where students have to share their collective carbon footprint. You could then expand from that into actions they're going to take to reduce their own carbon footprint. And then you could go beyond that and look at um, the carbon footprint of the local community or of the uh, of the country itself. And then, of course, to the world. And I think uh, that would be a good example of how um, global city of education doesn't have to be done all in one go um you can build it out um in that sort of uh, that spiral effect like working from from a small beginning into to more sophisticated things and perhaps uh, i've just put an example on the screen again this all comes from macmillan's global stage series which is primary this is the top level level six it's looking at what could you do in your community that would benefit young people so again bringing it back to the the community and um, kind of the responsibility of us as individuals to make positive changes. What I, I particularly like here is um, is a focus on decision making, how you make your own decisions, asking children or students at level six, uh, what's going on when you make a decision? Is it a responsible decision that you're making? And what's the outcome of that decision? Um, there have been a, a few questions in the chat box about materials. So uh, again, it's not just primary. Macmillan also has a, a lot of secondary uh, series um, and I've just taken a few examples of reading texts from these. Uh, here's one which is an um, example of a global citizen, a teenage global citizen. In fact, two of them, uh, two sisters in Indonesia who um, have set up a project to uh, reduce the use of plastic bags in their community. And again, it's a traditional reading text, but it's got great content that you could then explore further with your own students. Could they be like these Indonesian um, teenagers and look at ways for reducing the use of plastic in their home, in their school, in their community? Um, other uh, aspects, here's a topic that probably hasn't been covered before in English language teaching, but it's an interesting one. Um, we're looking at cultures here, perhaps the elderly, cult the culture of older people. So the issue of ageism here. Um, what are the stereotypes when um, teenagers think of older people? And equally, what do older people think of teenagers? So you're looking at kind of both perspectives here, uh, trying to put yourself in the shoes of other people. And of course, learning a second language, you're very much putting yourself in the shoes of another culture, uh, another language group. So I think that ties in nicely. Um, Greta Thunberg, of course, perhaps we couldn't go without mentioning Greta. Um, she might come up as a, a symbol of somebody who's trying to make a change in the community. But equally, there's always controversy around these individuals. What I particularly liked with this activity from uh, Macmillan Secondary uh, Materials, it's a, it's a grammar text focusing, I think, on um, use of future verb forms. So it's a, a traditional grammar gap fill, but the whole content and text is about Greta Thunberg when she went to America, not by plane, but by boat. And it actually um, questions whether uh, her action was appropriate or not. And what there was some criticism about it because the team people had to fly, uh, fly out and they had to fly back again. So we're not necessarily promoting Greta Thunberg as an ideal model, but just giving her as a, a model here of somebody who's trying to make a change in the world and looking at her in the round, looking at her fully, and yet still learning grammar through that context. So I, I thought that was a nice example from Macmillan of how you can um, you know, incorporate both uh, language learning and uh, global citizenship issues. 
And I've just got one more here. Um, Macmillan also has kind of project work. Uh, here's a nice example of a project where it encourages uh, students in one school to um, share a presentation about this topic with uh, students in, in another school. That could be within your own country or it could be um, another country um, where you're both then using your uh, second language English skills to collaborate and, and share ideas. And what's really nice here, the topic is famous icons, and it's getting you to imagine um, a famous person in your country, but also importantly, to consider whether that individual is actually famous outside your country. So again, it's considering other people, how they view yourselves, your country. And I think that's such an important part of global citizenship, that you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of other people out there. And of course, a product, uh, a project like this, a presentation, allows you to collaborate, um, think about your communicative language skills. And importantly, at the end, there's evaluation looking at how well you think you've done. And perhaps if you're watching a presentation of someone else, um, peer evaluation, considering how well you think um, they have contributed to the, pro um, to the, the project as well. So I think there's there's lots of um, synergy there between English language teaching and global citizenship education. Okay, um, we've just got a few minutes, I guess, uh, before our session ends. Um, perhaps now is an opportunity for us to answer any questions either that we've seen in the chat box or any that uh, Federica has managed to, to gather together. Federica, Hi. has anything come in? Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Mark. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Great, thank you. So first of all, thank you for such an amazing session. It was absolutely astounding um, and I just loved it. And as you can see, people loved it as well. Um, you got a shout out from Dave in the chat box as well, saying that you described exactly what he wanted to um, express. So thank you for that as well. Great. Um, Could we, we definitely, uh, actually, I'd love to, yes. I'd love to take, take the tricky questions that Kate were coming in about the um, ideology, someone said uh, ideology thing, and I think someone else asked about um, uh, orient, you know, is this just Orientalism in the 21st century? And I thought um, Jonathan's example towards the end there of Greta was a really good example of how it shouldn't be and how we would like it not to be. Um, so, and another good example would be um, if you're talking about environmental issues in say a country where um, there's a massive population and uh, you want to raise the quality of life of everyone. And there is a tension between um, making carbon emission cuts to support the environment versus uh, jobs to raise the quality of life for everyone and, and decrease poverty. I think the idea of uh, incorporating global citizen education into the classroom, particularly at the secondary level and above, is to pose those questions and to ask students to debate them and to, um, uh, to come up with their own interpretation. It's not just to, to impose an ideology that this is what you should do. And I thought the Greta example was good for that because it said Greta has done this, but hey, we should also question, was this really carbon neutral? So um, it should, if global citizen education is to be successful, it should always be about not trying to impose an ideology. Um, so I hope that's a small answer to those, those tricky questions. Any other questions you've got come through, Federica? Yeah, a lot of them. And I'm actually so happy that you're happy to tackle the hard ones. Uh, it's very brave and I really, really appreciate that because uh, I'm also really interested. So um, there was Anna asking quite a few questions. Um, and the first one was, is it important to know and promote what your own community is as well as what others are doing? So can you find examples in your own daily life? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I think I said at the beginning, so global is not necessarily about the entire world. It's also looking at um, what's kind of going on outside yourself as the individual. Um, and I think Matt mentioned you, we can do this at all levels, but particularly with the lower levels, pre-primary and primary, where you're considering this, you might want to be focusing on um, the individual child or their family or their school and getting them to explore, you know, what things do they do in the school? How do they behave in the school? What kind of things can they do within their family to help and support, um, you know, their their parents. Also exposing them to ideas um, about what's going on in their their own own world, which might be relatively limited. Um, so yes, definitely exploring your, your own attitudes, uh, perhaps looking at how other people might 
uh, perceive yourself as well. I think that's always a really interesting topic. Um, how do you believe the outside world considers you? Uh, and um, perhaps, you know, areas that you might need to change on that. Thank you. That's a great answer. And I think it links very well to Aisa's question. Um, so Aisa was asking, can you expect your students, especially if they're young, uh, not fully adults yet, and at whatever age, if they're mm. still developing themselves, can you expect them to develop a global citizenship awareness and, you know, kind of uh, think outwardly when they are not thinking inwardly yet? Um, yes, definitely. And uh, I, this goes back to, you know, looking at morals, looking at values, looking at teaching respect um, with the very young ones. It can be perhaps showing them that there is diversity in the, the small world that they inhabit. Um, one example I, I give often is when you're teaching colors and you're teaching fruits, um, you know, a banana is yellow perhaps expose students to the idea that not all bananas are yellow. You can have green bananas. Um, they're still a banana. You're learning the word green, um, but it might be a banana for cooking rather than for eating. So bananas come in all shapes and sizes. And the type of materials that you show them as well, that when they learn the word family, um, family might also be, you know, grandparents looking after a child in certain circumstances. Also, um, just kind of getting rid of stereotypes, um, as Matt mentioned about a nurse and a doctor, the materials that we give them uh, when they learn the word boy and girl, um, does it always have to be uh, an example of a sort of stereotypical boy? Could it be a picture of a, a boy in a wheelchair, for example? It's still a boy, but just broadening the, the depth of experience that these students come across when they're learning quite basic English or basic skills. And I would add, I'd also think, I'd add there, Jonathan, that it's, this is why it's so important that global citizenship education is seen as a holistic thing that can't be delivered uh, you know, overnight in a, in say, if someone said to you that uh, this grade 11 textbook is going to tell you everything you need to know about global social education, then that would be wrong. <laughs> it, uh, it has to start at the early age, building up the, uh, the ideas and kind of priming students for the more sophisticated ideas that come later on. And uh, has to be approached from those different angles that we talked about as well, from the knowledge, the skills, the actions. So um, uh, I think, yeah, you've answered that perfectly, Jonathan. And you can come back to the same topics and themes in greater depth, explore them from different angles as the students get older. And uh, it, it's lifelong learning. Working with Matt, I've been learning a lot more about myself and my own attitudes. Um, it just it goes on forever, I'd say. That's a great answer. Mm -hmm. um, there was a teacher also asking, how would you teach morals and values within a diverse community? Would you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's good. Yeah. So the diversity is the important part. Diversity is good. I mean, that's um, one of the big issues with global citizenship education, to know how other people approach things, how other people think about things. Uh, I'd say there probably are some universal um, human values and morals. You know, respect is not owned by one particular community. So I draw on the strengths of the diverse student body around you um, when you're dealing with these issues. The UAE, actually, which is where my, my research is focused, is a great example of that. So they have uh, a very diverse um, community, which doesn't come without its problems. Um, you know, they, as you probably will be familiar with, they've got a really big um, uh, expatriate population. Um, and, you know, there's, there's big migration flows as well. And um, one of the reasons why they actually want to uh, build global citizenship education into their curriculum is to try and um, you know, explore those those areas as well, and try to create a harmonious community by uh, by tackling that that head on. So, I think actually it's a really good context to uh, to develop global citizenship. Thank you. And um, Anna was also asking whether you think that the pandemic has implemented um, easily the use of soft skills and the teaching of soft skills. Um, and the pandemic, I think, has just shown the importance of global citizenship education. This is a, a worldwide issue that has required close collaboration and cooperation, both within nations, between nations, um, organizations like the World Health Organization, international organizations. And on the flip side, I think it's shown up um, some of the, the challenges that we face, both within our communities and within the world, the inequalities that exist. So. Um, there's no better time than, than now to really be focusing on you know, what unites us uh, as a world community and what we can all do to 
to make a difference and perhaps get out of this pandemic as quickly as possible. Thank you. And I think we have time for a couple more, which are um, interlinked. So they were asking, what can you do to um, use global citizenship education practically in an international environment? So you do that uh, locally already. Are there any um, places, any websites, anything that you can advise um, to make it more internationally focused within your classroom? And then Lawrence was asking uh, whether there's any criteria or how do you measure where and how uh, GCE is most successful or effective? Really good questions. Um, I, I have a good answer to the, the first one, Jonathan, um, which is that um, there are some brilliant initiatives out there, actually, if, you do, if I understand the question correctly, if you do want to engage at the international level. Uh, for example, the British Council has something called Connected connecting classrooms, I think. Um, and it's the idea where you can, um, you know, by a video call, engage with a classroom um, uh, on the other side of the world and maybe explore a topic together. Um, and this is where, you know, not, not to um, uh, not to impose anything, but I think this is where maybe as teachers that are potentially using similar Millen education textbooks or other or other publishers, um, you could look for other um, classes around the world that are using the same curriculum as you and maybe explore those topics together, um, you know, using the, all this great technology that we now have. Thank you. And, and the I second question, say, should we answer the second say, what was, can you mind us of the second question, possibly, Federica? Yeah, absolutely. It was how do you measure um, where and how global citizenship education is being effective and how much it is, if it is? Now that is tough, isn't it? <laughs> um, Saved it for last. I'm uh, I'm trying to measure in my research uh, whether it's there in the textbook. Um, I haven't, uh, so I have been sort of looking at uh, whether students are exposed to it and the activities they're doing. Uh, I'm less uh, knowledgeable about um, you know how you you check that it's uh, actually uh, the, the results from that. I, I think you can see how you could measure for knowledge and potentially skills. I think the action part of it is going to be much more difficult, and in fact, probably recognizing that is a uh, is the first step towards appreciating that this is quite different from other uh, types of um, educational um, you know, framework. I don't know if you what you could add to that, Jonathan. It's a tricky yeah, question. No, it is. Have we run out of time? <laughs> we have, <haven't> we? Yeah. <laughs> So thank you so much for your great knowledge. It was just amazing to listen to you and to read the you know, teachers in the chat box. They were so engaged. So thank you for that. And we'll let you go now because we'll have Matt and Jonathan later on this afternoon again. So we just want you to get a little bit of rest before the second session. But thank you so much. It was a real honor and a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your lovely comments as well, everyone. It's been yep. great uh, having this discussion with you. Thank you. Yep. Bye.